Well, it's 6 o'clock in the evening here on the eastern U.S. I believe it's 8 o'clock in the morning tomorrow in Queensland, Australia. Uh, whatever time of day it is where you are tuning in to either attend or to watch the recording of this event, welcome, thank you. Um, this is going to be a bit of light relief, I hope, from some pretty dire times that we're all living through. Um, my name is Dendra Best. You've been communicating with me if you've registered for this event. I'm the Executive Director for Wastewater Education. Uh, and Ben is one of our board members. We have a pretty diverse and far-flung board membership. So um, we like to pull in interesting commentary and interesting events from pretty much all over the world. And I see one of our attendees today is Luis Suertas, who on our YouTube site, you will find a recording from him from Earth Month a couple of years ago when we talked about the impact of Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria. Uh, before we get underway with Ben's presentation, we do need to say thank you to The Wet Show who are underwriting this platform for us for this coming year and who are sponsoring a series of events for professional development hour and CU credit. So if you need the certificate for attending this event or watching the recording, uh, contact me. If you are present, you will receive one at the close of business. So let's uh, quick hear from Doug Douglas Lugo. Hello, my name is Douglas Lugo, Hello. the director of the WET Douglas Show, Lugo, the and I'd like to welcome you to the session. The WET Show team has put together as a series of CEU qualification classes that we hope you will find helpful. These are uncertain times. It's extremely important to be up to date on how the wastewater industry has been affected during COVID-19. The WET Show team has launched the WET Plus initiative as a one-stop shop for resources meant to help our industry stand tall. Please visit our site, the Wet Show, that's www.ettshow.com, to access these resources. And remember, we are essential. Thank you, and enjoy the session. Okay, let me just put this one away. And uh, here is your video screen if you want to use it, Ben. Let me make this a bit bigger. And remember, folks, so you can use that full screen toggle switch and uh, to make any of these slides bigger. Uh, ben, I'm going to hide your video screen if you don't want to use it. That'll be perfectly fine with me. I'll go to the for radio. <laughs> okay, there it goes. So uh, take it away, Ben. Introduce yourself and what your topic is for this evening. G'day, I'm Ben Keel. I'm uh, director of ARIS, which is a water treatment and uh, technology company based in Australia. We're uh, based, our head office is on the Wake campus of the Adelaide University, so we do an awful lot of research work and uh, we tend to work with interesting effluents all across the world, primarily here in Australia. But today's topic is, is actually about Lake Gula, which is uh, at the Whitford Folk Festival site. And it's a natural swimming lake, so no forms of um, disinfection. It was constructed in 2019. So the Whitford Folk Festival is the largest music festival in the Southern Hemisphere. It runs between Christmas and New Year every year, uh, which in the Southern Hemisphere is the middle of summer. So yeah, good temperatures, Average, you know, minimum temperatures of around 20 degrees centigrade up to about 40 degrees centigrade. So for those watching in the Northern Hemisphere, it's a very different type of Christmas. It is not a white Christmas. Um, and around 140,000 people attend the festival all up over the week. Normally, you'll get a minimum of 20,000 people per day on the site and a maximum in the mid-30s per day. And it really depends on where the public holidays and the weekends are falling in that week as far as people numbers. New Year's Eve is always the busiest um, day of the festival. And uh, I tend to uh, 
spend New Year's Eve running the sewage treatment plant that we built there on site. So I have a very different view of New Year's to, to most people. And the whole reason we've done the risk assessment on this site is that our company, Aris Design, built, operate and maintains a batching sewage treatment plant here on this site. So we had water quality assessment gear already uh, at the location. And when the swimming lagoon was constructed, uh, we were asked to take over the water quality work on it. So Lake Gula was designed and built by Patrick Handley of Waterscapes Australia. So his company specialises in these types of natural swimming lagoons. You can have a look at the website there. They've got ones that go in people's backyards to commercial sites, all the way up to this one here at uh, the Woodford Folk Festival site. Lake Gula is named after a local Indigenous man, Uncle Noel Blair of the Jimbara people, and it means koala. And uh, you can have a look at the Whitford Folk Festival site with the lake video there off that link. There's plenty of resources on site, uh, online, sorry, that give uh, a lot of background information as far as, uh, yeah, the lake itself. So the volume of the lake is approximately 13 million litres or 3 million gallons. It's a natural swimming lake, so there are no disinfection chemicals used at this site. So there's no chlorine, there's no ozone, there's no ultralight disinfection. There's upflow rock filters, which uh, have a rock media in suitable and a plastic media for the growth of beneficial microorganisms. So it's a purely biological form of disinfection. And the lake has been stocked with thousands of fish, plenty of reptiles, there's birds, there's eels, there's mollusks, and it's been planted with native plants. So it's a living system. And uh, that adds to the beauty of the lake. But if you think about the fish and the snakes and the lizards and the birds and the eels, they're all excreting into that water. So we know right from the start, before a single swimmer heads into the lake, that we're going to have um, wastewater from the animals living in the lake in there. And when people get in there, it's only going to get a, a higher load of potential pathogens and uh, chemis chemicals associated with uh, people and animals swimming in a lagoon. So yeah, it was a, an interesting challenge. So there's a, a bit of a look at uh, information sign at, at the lake um, with the lake in the background there. And you can see the uh, different types of animals and birds which have been stocked into the lake. Um, there's even lungfish in there, which is one of the oldest forms of uh, fish uh, still existing on the planet. So there's a drone view of the lake. Uh, what you can see there is that it's got a, a variety of different depths. So very deep over here in this section, there's an island in the middle. One of the upflow filters is over here. There's another upflow filter through here. The water gets pumped or extracted from the lake via this pump inlet bay through here and then pumped around. So uh, yeah, she's not a small lake, very large. Uh, swimmers enter via the beaches. So the beaches here, and the beaches down there. So yeah. Dendra's pointing arrows out for me. That's very helpful. Thank you, Dendra. So, yeah. The risk assessment. There's no specific legislation or regulations for natural swimming lagoons in Australia. A literature review found very few guidelines uh, worldwide that were directly applicable. Now, there was lots of information on natural bathing water guidelines and how they should be, but that's more for natural uh, rivers and streams and even ocean outfalls, but if you've constructed a, uh, a lake, yeah, it was a bit of a grey area. Now, our risk assessment had to be split into two parts. We had the physical risk to swimmers, so that was lifeguards, visibility, all those types of things. So the normal risk assessment that you'd do for a municipal swimming pool, all those types of things, and we had specialists focusing on that. The area that we, as a water company, focused on more was the water quality risks to swimmers. And we used the natural bathing water guidelines in regards to levels of E. coli, entrococci, ammonia, phosphorus, 
as a guideline as to how we should be setting these things up. We split our tests into our microbiological tests and our water chemistry tests. And the other thing, with a natural upflow filter process using beneficial microorganisms, it was completely unknown how effective um, those filters would be prior to them being commissioned. Now, we knew that they would work. It was to the extent that they would work, because if you're just dosing in um, chlorine, you can add enough chlorine until you get the chlorine residual that uh, you're chasing. You can do the same with ozone, with UV light. You can recirculate the water until you get the disinfection level that you're chasing. This treatment process is using beneficial microbes. So they've actually got to grow up. They've got to commission. And how they react the first day they, they're installed is very different to how they'll react three months later. And this being a festival site, the lake wasn't in constant use. So prior to the festival, it had a, a relatively low level of usage from people who were swimming of an afternoon after work setting up the festival, and then they got that really big hit during the week when the festival was on of um, thousands of people suddenly using the lake. So we knew that the usage pattern was going to change. So the upflow filters, there are two filters that treat around 500,000 litres or 130,000 gallons per hour. The media is designed to allow the beneficial microbes to grow on the surface of the media. Uh, there is further water treatment uh, provided by constructed wetland, which is planted on top of the upflow filters. And with one of the filters, uh, additional aeration is provided by a waterfall, that it actually uh, cascades down a waterfall before it enters back into the lake. So this is the underneath of the upflow filters. You can see some of the distribution pipe work. There is a plastic cage work down the bottom, and then they're covered in rocks. And this is where they're planting out the uh, Waterscapes Australia are planting out the top with wetland plants. So this is the water flow through the lake. So you can see that uh, water flows in this direction towards that pump bay that I was talking about there before. It is pumped back around. See Dendra's going right with the arrows again. Through the two upflow filters. So there's one in the top left-hand corner, another in the bottom right-hand corner. The one in the top left-hand corner has got the uh, waterfall cascade with it. And um, yeah, so around 500,000 litres an hour or 130,000 gallons is pumped through those and they're running 24 hours a day. The outcome for the risk assessment. So a water quality testing schedule was established as far as how often we were going to test the, the water. The um, lake was finished in late September and people started swimming in, in it in early October. So that's when we started testing the water, keeping in mind that the festival runs between Christmas and New Year. The water, the lake was filled with potable drinking water. There is a potable water treatment plant on site. So it treated enough water to actually fill the lake. So we started off with water of a potable standard to begin with. And um, yeah, we had quite a lot of variation when the uh, lake was first completed because those beneficial microorganisms needed time to grow and establish. And um, We were unsure as far as scientifically, at the end of the risk assessment, how many people should be swimming in the lake. Um, it was that much of a gray area. There was a, a team of us, you'd see the team there on the front page of the uh, PowerPoint. And we were debating backwards and forwards as far as what's going to be the safe number of people who were swimming because we couldn't exactly run trials. We couldn't put uh, a thousand people in or we couldn't put 5,000 people in. Um, so we were doing it all off a desktop. This is where the lifeguard assessment came through and saved us because the lifeguard risk assessment was really looking at how many people were visible from the different lifeguard points and how many lifeguards could actually be stationed in around the lagoon. And they came up that 500 swimmers per hour would be allowed at the lake. 
So as part of the, the festival rules, if you wanted to swim at the lake, you're nominated on the website, you were nominated at a time. The lake opened at six o'clock in the morning and closed at six o'clock at night. The lifeguard risk assessment, no swimming at night um, because of the visibility concerns. So 500 per hour was uh, how many people were visible to the lifeguards. And so for us with the water quality assessment, that was in the midpoint range of what we were looking at. So we used the, the lifeguard risk assessment to determine how many people would be swimming in the lake every day, what would be the maximum number per hour. And um, as the testing schedule shows, uh, it actually went fairly well. And the other thing with the testing schedule, it was quite different prior to the festival compared to during the festival. So during the festival between Christmas and New Year, we really had to ramp up the amount of testing that we were doing, but the testing that we were doing had to change as well because uh, the resources that were available to us changed, which I'll go into a bit more detail. So this is a risk assessment done for the lifesavers. So you can see that there were uh, seven stationed uh, around the lake anytime there were patrons in there and uh, they broke it up into zones of zones of visibility. So we used the, uh, the numbers of people that they could observe as the maximum number of people uh, in the lake at any one time. Now the water chemistry results. Now this slide I'm actually talking about uh, some that we, we took and didn't, I'm not actually presenting today. So biochemical oxygen demand, um, it was always less than five milligrams per litre through the entire testing process. Colour, turbidity and total suspended solids, they're all very low. There's nothing, uh, no guideline levels were breached. There was nothing in there really to discuss. What I will discuss is pH, electrical conductivity, ammonia, total nitrogen and total phosphorus. So the pH, it pretty much kept around eight. Um, when the lake was commissioned, green algae began to grow relatively quickly, and green algae puts carbonates into the water, uh, which makes the water slightly alkaline. And uh, that actually meant that the pH pretty much sat between eight and eight and a half for just about the entire commissioning period. Now we noticed that during the festival, which is towards the right hand side of that graph, the number of people that were in there moving around, the actual amount of green algae uh, that was in the lake decreased during the week of the festival. And there was lots of skin debris and various other bits and pieces going into the, into the lake. So the pH dropped. Didn't drop all that much. We're still only talking, you know, 7.6 type of thing, but it was a noticeable drop. As soon as the festival stopped and the number of people who were in the, the lake um, decreased markedly, the pH went back up to eight and the green algae level also went back up. So um, yeah, the pH did fluctuate slightly, but remained uh, slightly alkaline at all times. Electrical conductivity, on the left hand side of that graph, you can see where we started putting in the, the potable water that uh, was around 400 microsiemens a centimeter, uh, right from the word go. As it evaporated, and keep in mind that uh, this lake was commissioning over summer, uh, the salinity of the water actually increased. Now the water was being topped up every couple of days with a little bit of uh, potable water to offset uh, evaporation. But um, yeah, some of those salts were being left behind and the water became slightly more saline over time. In um, early 2020, you can see there was a major rainfall event on site and the actual salinity dropped a bit. And the lake itself is actually bunded from overland flow as far as stormwater being able to run across the ground and get into the lake, but it's still impacted by the rainfall that falls directly onto the lake. So uh, that's what caused that little drop in electrical conductivity there. But the uh, salinity level was a good way of showing that it's a, a nice little closed system. Ammonia, we got very low levels of ammonia. If you're looking there, you know, it's 0 0.05 milligrams per litre at, at commissioning. And if you consider that there are literally thousands of fish, lots of birds, um, 
reptiles and everything else living in here. To be honest, we expected a much higher level of ammonia than this right from the word go. But it does seem to indicate that the nitrogen cycle was working very well and that the upflow filters were very effective at uh, reducing contaminants of concern such as ammonia. Now, we could not get ammonia tested during the week of the, the festival um, in real time uh, Well, with the, the labs. Between Christmas and New Year, I'm sure it's the same all around the world. The majority of labs are shut. Um, we did have a colometric test, which I'll go into a bit more, having a look at ammonia levels here on site. And the colometric test showed that ammonia was, was keeping low as well. We did have that little jump right at the end of the year. Once people stopped coming to the lake, the birds moved in, in a large way. And we did actually find some increase, small increase in contaminants of concern from the uh, fecal matter the birds were putting into the lake, but still very low levels, you know, 0.04 milligrams per litre. I've got plenty of um, sewerage sites where I'd be over the moon if I was getting that level of ammonia in uh, just an official microbe treatment uh, systems. So total nitrogen, once again, overall, very low levels of nitrogen. Um, so ranging between, well, all the way down to 0 0.1 up to uh, one milligram per litre of total nitrogen. The green algae, um, which is there in the pond, uh, some Australian green algae species and some uh, cyanobacteria or blue green algae species can actually fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So you'll get uh, a bit of a nitrogen increase when uh, algae are growing in Australian lakes. Um, with having a look at the long-term impact of the, uh, the birds and the l number of birds who are at the lake at any one time and what impact they're having on total nitrogen. But with total nitrogen averaging less than uh, one milligram per litre over the, the course of the testing period, we're very happy that the uh, nitrogen cycle is moving along and that there doesn't seem to be any restrictions on the amount of organic carbon putting a handbrake on uh, nitrogen reduction, uh, total nitrogen reduction. And if you think about the um, BOD level uh, being less than five milligrams per litre all the way through this uh, testing process as well, um, you know, those two data points go hand in hand or agree with each other. Total phosphorus, once again, very, very low numbers. So 0 0.01 milligrams per litre. Um, there is a bit of a, a clay lining over the top of the plastic liner and Australian clays are notoriously phosphorus poor. So there could be a bit of phosphorus absorption going on there. Um, we did notice a bit of an upkick here at the end, all the way up to 0 0.03 milligrams per litre. So once again, you know, it, it's a s s low level, but it is an upkick. And we noticed that when the, the bird numbers really increased at the lake. And if you think about it, you know, there's an awful lot of phosphorus, which is in bird feces. So that's something that we're going to be keeping an eye on over time. Microbiological analysis. Uh, we did a fairly extensive one. This uh, slide here is just talking about things really that we didn't find. So with the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, there's all the species, and don't ask me to pronounce all of those because I will get some of them wrong. Um, we tested for all of those cyanobacteria or blue-green algae species all the way through our testing period. In the first week, we found a very few number of cells with some of those species. But um, after the first four weeks of commissioning, there was nil detected and uh, nil detected all, all the way through up to our, our current testing. So they were there in a very minor way to begin with, but they soon got outcompeted by the green algae species and uh, knocked back by the beneficial microorganisms. So, yep, um, cyanobacteria, because it can be a contact toxin as well as a... Uh, Ingestion toxin, it was one that we were very focused on, that we did not want people swimming in the in the lake if there were um, high levels or me, me, anything above low levels of cyanobacteria to be able to, to show conclusively that uh, 
yeah, there were some that there to begin with and then none uh, for the last six months has been very beneficial. We are also having a look for potential protozoa, so um, which cause gastroenteritis. We have nil detected any um, protozoa, pathogenic protozoa, through the course of the, uh, the testing regime. So that's been good as well that uh, we're fairly sure that some would have been introduced at some point, but uh, the beneficial microbes in the upflow filters seem to be able to knock them out or, or eat them or compete against them. So Escherichia coli, no chemicals or ultraviolet disinfection process. Um, we knew that there'd be E. coli in the water. You know, we've deliberately put in animals which will be excreting E. coli. Uh, and we also know that all through the commissioning period, um, there was dozens, if not a, a hundred or 200 people swimming in the lake every day. They would be shedding E. coli just off their uh, external parts of their body, even if they haven't had a code brown in, in the water. So I, um, we knew that there would be levels of E. coli which were there. During the commissioning level, so the lake was open, Thousand people swam in the lake and uh, over the course of the weekend. And you can see that we had a bit of a spike right up there at the start where those people first started swimming in the lake. Then as the microbes established on the rock filters and the upflow filters, the number of E. coli decreased dramatically. And we're sitting around 10 colony forming units per 100 mil, which is well and truly below the... Uh, restrictions put into uh, most natural bathing water guidelines around the world. So there's plenty of natural lakes, rivers, streams, even ocean outfalls, where you can go swimming and encounter much higher levels of E. coli per 100 mil. So uh, we were very happy to see that reduction. It was a, uh, it's what we were expecting, but we couldn't guarantee that it was going to occur, seeing that we're dealing with a uh, biological system. Fecal entrococci actually started off very low. We cultured fecal entrococci because they tend to last in the environment a lot longer than Escherichia coli. Uh, they're more robust as far as temperatures are concerned. So we were expecting um, that during the commissioning period that these were actually going to be higher than E. coli, but they turned out to be a bit lower. They did stick around the 80 to 90 uh, colony forming units uh, per 100 mil, and constantly around that level, they got down a, a, as low as two or three, but uh, stuck up below the 100 for the majority. We did get one big spike right at the end. It was one single sample on its own, and it was when there was, uh, yeah, probably just under a thousand birds uh, observed sitting in the lake. And yeah, we think it's rely that that spike was in relation to the, the amount of bird wildlife that was at the lake at that time. But we would need to test more and uh, do additionally sampling to, uh, to basically verify that number. So it was interesting for us because that was just about the only fecal bacteria that we, we had a decent spike in like that. But um, yeah, we'll see how additional testing goes. Heterotrophic, so your general back microorganisms um, started off high. So that opening weekend, the thousand people who are in the lake, you can see there on the top left hand side, the numbers were up really high. Then they dropped down very low as far as the next sampling event is concerned and we think that was due to an absence of food, that there just wasn't very many people at the site using the lake at that particular time. Then the setup crews began to move in through the middle part and there's constantly a couple of hundred people swimming in the lake every day. And um, then during the festival event, it went up a little bit. And then uh, as people left and the number of patrons and the amount of biological uh, food source in the lake decreased, the heterotrophic plate count went down again. So we think that that's moving um, very much in relation to the uh, microbial load which is being added to the lake and the, the patron numbers and the number of people who are 
using it at any one time. Pseudomosis originosis. This one gave us more grey hairs than uh, any other pathogen that we had a look at. And it's an opportunistic pathogen. So it generally only attacks uh, people who are immunocompromised. So you might be on chemotherapy, um, you might be on antibiotics fighting a, a serious in infection. And you can see there that the first couple of tests that we did on the left hand side of the graph, two and a half thousand um, column, well, MPN, most probable numbers per 100 mil, right up there at the start. And um, yeah, that is over a limit because we we're looking to keep it under a thousand as far as our risk assessment was concerned with the most probable numbers of pseudomosis originosis. And it dropped down fairly quickly, but it also come back up right near that thousand level again and, and dropped back down. So this is one that we've got to keep a, a very close eye on. The numbers were very low during the festival. Being a skin bacteria, we you know think it's just washing off people's skin uh, into the water. It can survive in aquatic environment for quite a long time. And we, you can see that the beneficial microorganisms were able to keep its numbers low for the vast majority of the time, but not always. So it's something which we'll keep testing for as part of our risk assessment process and, and keep an eye on it to, uh, yes, have a look at that. We did put information campaigns up that uh, if people were immunocompromised that uh, they shouldn't swim in the lake. During the festival. Now the festival is a wonderful time of the year. I love the festival, Mike. We're always down there because we run the sewage treatment plant. So we that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week for that week between Christmas and New Year. My children think that Santa Claus only delivers to sewage treatment plants. That's where they've spent every Christmas since they've been born. But between Christmas and New Year is an absolutely horrible time to try and get any analysis done. So all of that analysis that we have just looked at in those previous slides is all being done by NADA accredited laboratories. Um, it's all been, all of that research or data analysis has been done offsite. Um, now we couldn't get samples to labs, even if labs were open between Christmas and New Year. The public holidays, so there's no freight. Um, we just did not have the same labs available to us in that in that week to be able to do the tests. Plus the fact that test results, micro will come back to you typically within three or four days. Um, but water chemistry is uh, a week to 10 days, even if you paid for it to be expressed. So that meant that if we were sending samples away to see what these 500 patrons per hour or 6,000 swimmers per day were doing to the water quality, um, the festival would be over before we got the first set of results back. So we had to set up a water quality laboratory at the Woodfordia site and do a whole range of tests ourselves. So what we started testing for is fecal coliform tests, which uh, we took a sample at 4 a.m. every morning and 6 p.m. every afternoon. Ammonia and phosphate tests, once again performed at 4 a.m. in the morning and 6 p.m. in the afternoon. We had portable water quality probe. Um, so looking at pH, electrical conductivity, turbidity and dissolved oxygen, and we took them every four hours, so 6 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. And we put in dissolved oxygen logging probes in the upflow filter to make sure that we could keep an eye on what was having, happening with the DO. So our thinking behind that is that if the filters began to get biologically overloaded um, with code brown, skin flakes, all those types of things, um, that the dissolved oxygen levels in the filters would dra drop dramatically. So we had to change our testing regime during the course of the festival itself. So our on-site laboratory, you can see there that we're uh, setting up to do some uh, fecal coliform tests on most probable number. The colometric test there, looking at uh, doing ammonia and um, phosphate. So here's some of the fecal coliform plates done in situ. So this is how we spend Christmas. So 25th to the 12th, um, it's how everybody wants to spend Christmas is taking water samples out of lakes and uh, 
culturing up fecal coliforms. But you can see there that the number of fecal coliforms which is in the lake was actually low. Um, this one is just going to show that that was taken at uh, 6 p.m. in the afternoon. So that's after 28th of uh, December is right in the middle of the festival period. So people have been swimming in that lake all day. It was just under 6,000 patrons had swum in the lake that day. That's how many fecal coliforms we played it up. What we did find is that where the um, lake wasn't being used at, at night, that when we did the morning test, so the AM test, the four o'clock in the morning test, before anybody had started swimming in the lake, the fecal coliform count was quite often less than one. That there'd been uh, the beneficial upflow filters had managed to completely knock out all the fecal coliforms over the course of the night as the water was recirculated around. And that was a much better result than what we were expecting. And the other thing that we noticed as far as these fecal coliform plates are concerned, is that uh, we actually had higher numbers towards the start of the week. At Christmas, Boxing Day, 27th of December, we had higher numbers in the afternoon. As the beneficial microbes got enough food in the upflow filters to grow and um, become basically accustomed to the number of people who were swimming in the lake um, per day, the uh, performance of the filters improved. So. That was fantastic news for us because uh, it showed that there was excess capacity in the system and that was able to uh, manage the, uh, the flow which was going in there. So there's the water quality probe going around testing the water. That was a very popular job uh, amongst our, our crew because uh, the view and the lake of uh, and the patrons were all very pleasant and, and happy coming up and having a, a, a chat with us as far as uh, going around and taking those those samples and uh, yeah everything remained consistent through the course of the uh, the week we didn't actually have a, a spike the dissolved oxygen logging probe that uh, we installed is actually a, a nice American technology we imported in from the the US and uh, incredibly easy to set up and run. It was uh, a very good piece of technology. You can see that we've installed it right in the middle of the uh, rock media and the top of the upflow filter uh, in the middle of the constructed wetland. Um, this is the upflow filter, which has actually got the waterfall in it. So it's on the, uh, the far side away from the uh, pump intake. And it sat in there for the course of the, the festival and um, the blue line is the temperature and you can see a little bit of difference between day and night and the red line is the dissolved oxygen and you can see a bit of you know the same um, up and down to do with daylight there what was happening is that the green algae which is uh, in the lake releases oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis so the dissolved oxygen was always higher during the day and it dropped off a little bit at night and higher during the day and dropped off a little bit at night. And as the green algae got disturbed by the swimmers who were uh, swimming in the lake and this peak period graph, it's basically the week of the festival where this data is being collected from. You can actually see a slight decrease in DO as the amount of algae which was in the lake decreased, green algae, uh, which is in the lake decreased. But if we have a look at one of the non-peak periods, and to give an indication, this was taking a, um, a sample every 10 minutes. It was collecting a, a water quality sample. Now to be able to get the same probe to store the data for much longer, um, this one's taking a, a sample every two hours. So we changed for the non-peak periods where it's sit there to have a look at the water quality over months, um, not during days. We changed the, the testing or the sampling point frequency of the dissolved oxygen probe. And that big rainfall event that I was talking about there before, which lowered the salinity, you can actually see that it's lowered the temperature there. And it um, actually lowered the DO a bit as well in that point there. That's another big rainfall event through there and an overcast day. So that's the 
temperature being impacted by rainfall events and the DO got impacted a little bit by rainfall events as well. We think it's just because everything got stirred up a, a little bit, but it was only a, a short term event. You can see that the green algae grew back quite well through there and um, they actually uh, introduced some predators for green algae species around this point here to just knock the numbers back a bit. And you can see that the dissolved oxygen probe actually picked up a reduction in um, green algal numbers through there. So yeah, it was actually the dissolved oxygen probes have been very providing us with uh, a great deal of uh, useful information. So that's uh, sitting near the pump inlet bay, looking back towards the, uh, the beaches and the lakes. That's the constructed wetland and the upflow filter at the uh, top right hand side. On the bottom left hand side on the rock there, you can see where there's some birds been sitting and uh, excreting on the rocks. When nobody's swimming in the lake, it attracts hundreds of birds. Um, when people are swimming in the lake, you'll be lucky to get two or three birds there. But um, when people are swimming in the lake, you've got the occasional urination, code brown, you've got skin flakes and everything going through. So it will be interesting to test over time to see um, how the water quality changes in the lake compared to when people are using it predominantly compared to when wildlife are, are using it predominantly. So conclusion, the treatment process in Lake Gula worked very well. The upflow filters were effective and the beneficial microorganisms, beneficial microorganisms increased their performance over the week of the festival, um, much better than what we thought they were going to. Everyone swam safely, there were, the, there were no incidents. One of the things that we actually did is that there's a health clinic, a medical clinic for the festival right next door. And every day we went and talked to the health clinic, uh, the nurses and the doctors in there about cases of gastroenteritis at the festival. And there were one or two, but uh, they were linked back to food rather than to anything to do with the, uh, the lake or the potable water system, which was on site. So the numbers that it's a week long festival, there's 140,000 people go through uh, on an average year. There's always some cases of gastroenteritis with people camping and lots of um, fast food. We kept a track of what was going on with gastroenteritis with the medical clinic and there was uh, no in increases with uh, people swimming in the lake and we felt that that was uh, very helpful. One of the things that we understand from this process is that the intermittent use of the lake, like at the moment there's no one swimming in that, that lake and uh, there won't be anybody swimming in that, or won't be significant numbers of people swimming in that lake until Christmas time this year, and that's if the COVID-19 restrictions on music festival sites get listed in, uh, lifted in time. It means that the beneficial filters there are um, going to get uh, very different qualities of water going through depending on whether a festival is on and patrons are using the lake or whether it's predominantly being used by the wildlife. So we understand that there's going to have to be a commissioning uh, process done prior to each use of, of the lake. Um, it's not going to be standard. It's not going to be like a municipal swimming pool where you just add in the chlorine and make sure that you've got your residual levels there. We're actually going to have to do repeat a lot of this testing every year prior to the Woodford Folk Festival to ensure that the beneficial processes, the biological processes within the lake haven't changed and that they're still performing uh, the way that they did in 2019. Um, but it has also showed us that biological systems can be very effective, produce a wonderful water quality and be beautiful at the same time. So that's it for the presentation today. I was supposed to leave 15 minutes for questions and I've done it right on time, which is incredibly unusual for me. So I hope oh. you enjoy that for those people watching the recording. I hope you uh, have a wonderful time as well. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, let me put your contact information up here. We'll leave the PowerPoint up there in case somebody has questions. And here is Ben's contact information. Make that bigger. Yep. Are there any questions? Anybody going to?
Put anything into the chat. Um, one question that came up, because Ben gave a, a short version of this at this year's WET show in Indianapolis, and the question came up was how... Were there, were there any locations in the United States where this kind of system would be applicable? Yeah, well, um, there's plenty of locations in the United States. Patrick Handley from Waterscapes Australia went over and um, installed one in um, early February, just before the wet show this year in uh, Florida. So... He's an Australian company, but he, he works worldwide and has installed similar sites um, over in the United States. So that one um, at, at the wet show when that question was asked, he was still in the process of um, commissioning it. But supposedly, you know, it's doing really well. So how, would the climate conditions and the usage in Florida mirror the ones for Lake Gula? Yeah, well, uh, where the Woodford Folk Festival is located is in, in the subtropics, so just below the Tropic of Capricorn. Um, so it's by no means the type of winters that you are used to, uh, Dendra, but where Jim's there at Pismo Beach, maybe Jim, yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it... They have tried similar things in the United Kingdom and certain parts of Europe where it gets you know, very cold and can ice over during winter. It's a little bit outside my area of expertise as I sit here and talk to you from uh, tropical Australia where uh, in my hometown winter is a <laughs> Wednesday. But, um, yeah, the uh, seeing no one's going to be – in the northern parts of uh, North America, no one would be swimming in it in, in – um, winter it'd be iced over so as long as it went through the same type of commissioning process that we're talking about here at Woodford and you applied the risk assessment and did the, the the same type of testing I couldn't see why it couldn't be used even in the colder parts it of would America. be very interesting to see the post commissioning and some of the water testing for the one in Florida and compare it with the, this system do you know if that might be available yeah. soon? I'm not sure, but I'll ask Patrick. The other thing, you know, scientifically it's very interesting for us because I don't think we're going to get the same answers every time we run the commissioning tests. I think that we'll get a bit of variation because the, uh, the, bio, you know, the biota, the microbes which are in there will change slightly over time. Um, yeah, the, the levels of fish will change, the, the bird species which are coming in it will change. So, yeah, th there'll be a, a... Being a biological system, I don't expect it to remain consistent. So I, I'm interested to see how it varies each year we commission it up. Are there any questions from the participants? If you would like to ask them with a microphone, do let me know and otherwise type it into the chat window. Mike, who's there, he swum in the lake. He can tell you whether it's a nice place to swim. <laughs> I'm not seeing him raising in his hand, though, Ben, so maybe, maybe he's microphone shy, so. Mike's not shy. Oh, well, he's run away. Look at that. <laughs> Oh, okay, um, I think that is one of the most interesting sessions that we've hosted in a while. It's it's uh, it raises all the questions about swimming in freshwater lakes and about the biology that's happening in recreational waters because this is like that but with an extra layer of uh, biological treatment and control. And so it would be it would be really interesting to see how that one in Florida is functioning. Yep. Well, there's so much more swimming in freshwater lakes in North America than what's here in Australia because we're such a dry continent. We just do not have as many freshwater lakes as um, what you have. So uh, it's one of the reasons why we're out there building them. And. 
people that complain about having to deal with things floating in freshwater lakes. They could always have a swimming pool, but there it is. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, thank you for getting up so early in the morning to do this for us. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to close out the recording for this session. We'd love to have you come back again for our next public sessions. Uh, we have one coming up this Thursday afternoon from the Sensolo platform folks. And we'll have several more in May. And if you are an attendee, and you have a topic that you think would be good in this series, don't, don't hesitate to contact us. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.